Hey guys, Andy Robertson here with CQ Academy, and in today's video, I want to teach you all about the seven management and planning tools. Whether you're preparing for the CQ exam or the green belt exam or the black belt exam, today's video is for you. All right, let's head over to the computer and get started. All right, let's jump right into this. Okay, so I want to start by introducing the seven tools and kind of spending just a minute talking about why we do them. So if, you, if you're not familiar, right, the seven QC tools were originally developed for root cause analysis, right? And, and Ishikawa said that 95% of problems can be solved by these seven tools. And he's probably right, but over time, as problems became more complex and processes became more complex, the need for new tools sort of arose. The other thing that those tools don't really help you do is they don't help you make changes to your product or your process. Once you know the root cause, you have to go through a process to implement corrective actions. And so that's what a good chunk of these tools is for, is, is actually making changes to your product or process. And so these first three tools are the matrix diagram, the affinity diagram, and the inner relationship diagram. And these tools are what I call relationship analysis tools, meaning that Oftentimes when you have that really complex problem, you're going to have a lot of facts and ideas and concepts surrounding the problem that can be hard to understand. And these are great tools that help you brainstorm, analyze, visualize, and then communicate the relationship between all of these different ideas surrounding your, your problem or your product or your process. And then the next tool, the fourth tool, is the prioritization matrix. This is all about decision making. Again, when you have a really complex problem that you're trying to solve, making the right decision can be really difficult. And so this tool gives you the ability to objectively make a decision based on a number of different factors and weightings, and we'll get into all that. And then the last three tools are all about those implementation tools. So when you've got a big problem and you need to implement a corrective action to fix that problem, oftentimes that implementation can be complex, it can be long, it can be complicated. And so these tools, the tree diagram, the process decision program chart, and the activity network diagram are three fantastic tools that again help you understand everything you need to accomplish, right, to, to make that corrective action effective, and also how long is it going to take, what are the costs, and then what are the risks that we need to mitigate along the way. All right, let's get into this by talking about the matrix diagram. So this is the first tool, and the reason I want to talk about it is because it helps you understand the seven management and planning tools and how you can use them to both solve problems and implement corrective actions. So the matrix diagram looks exactly like this. It is a matrix, and generally it has two factors, sometimes you'll see three. But here what I'm showing is the relationship where one set of factors are my seven management planning tools, right? You can see them here, affinity diagram, interrelationship diagram, tree diagram, and so on. And then across the top are kind of those three major categories of why we use these tools. So the first, again, like I said, is relationship analysis. Understanding and being able to visualize and communicate the complex relationships that often exist in a complex problem. The second is decision making. By the way, you'll notice that the prioritization matrix has a strong positive relationship to decision making. That's what the tool is intended for. But some of these other tools have a weak relationship with decision making. For example, the affinity diagram, once you've gone through that process and categorized large sets of data, an affinity diagram can help you focus on the next phase of problem solving or the next phase of a corrective action or, or it can help lead you to a major decision regarding a problem or a process. And so some of these tools have a weak relationship with decision making, but obviously they're not intended for or they're not directly related to the decision making process. And then last is project planning and management. Again, you can do all the root cause analysis you want, but when it comes to implementing that corrective action, Oftentimes, that's its own project, right? It's its own complex process that you have to follow to actually make a change and, and implement a corrective action. And so you need tools to do that. And so the tree diagram is a great way to understand all those hierarchical relationships between the different tasks in a corrective action. And then we'll talk about this when we get there, but the process decision program chart is great for what I call risk management in project management. And then last but not least, obviously, is the activity network diagram. That's a fantastic tool for understanding project management as well as how long is the project going to take and what the critical path is. So that's kind of the matrix diagram. By the way, one of the most common matrix diagrams in quality is the house of quality. So this is kind of what it looks like. But if we zoom in here on the relationship matrix, that is a matrix diagram. And, and generally where we start is with understanding the relationships between customer needs. You can see those here on the left and our design inputs. 
And the reason this is so valuable is because oftentimes some of our design inputs or some of our customer needs have a negative relationship with each other. So you'll notice, for example, like customer need number two has a negative relationship with design input two and design input five. And so as we're optimizing our design around those design inputs, it's good to understand these relationships. So for example, if we're gonna optimize our design around design input three, that has a positive relationship with customer need three, six, and seven, but obviously that might have a negative impact on customer need number five. So as we're making those design trade-offs, as we're making those important decisions in the design process, we can use this relationship matrix to say, okay, if we optimize here, we might lose a little bit here. And by the way, you can see my legend here. There's different ways to do this. I'm just showing positive and negative. You can do strong, you can do weak. There's all sorts of different ways that you can you know, go even deeper to communicate the strength of the relationship between these, these two factors. And then if you, if you know anything about the house of quality, you'll know it's sort of a cascading event. So once you've done a matrix diagram that compares your customer needs against your design input, you can do another one showing your the relationship between your design inputs and your design outputs. And that can flow all the way down into the relationship between design outputs and your process and your process and the way you control your process. So for example, here's the matrix that, that you might create between your design inputs and your design outputs. Again, this is a great tool to say, okay, right? Design output, see here, has a negative relationship with multiple design inputs. So we just need to understand that relationship as we make those design trade-offs and really optimize our design. Okay, so the, the next tool is the affinity diagram. This is a fantastic tool that facilitates brainstorming and helps you organize facts and data into common themes or common groups. Now, the reason it's called an affinity diagram is that when two things, when two ideas have an affinity for each other, they share some sort of similarity or some characteristic that they have in common. Let's work through an example. Let's say you want to do a little bit of brainstorming around how do we get better at hitting our production targets. And so what you might do is you might get your team together, facilitate a brainstorming activity, put all these ideas down on post-it notes, and then we can use the affinity diagram to try to find common themes or common categories within the data. So if we start taking these and categorizing them, we might find some of them are related to maintenance, some of them are training, some of them are quality, maybe it might be the layout of our production floor, or maybe it's the equipment itself. There's all sorts of different groups or themes or categories associated with our data. Now, once we've done this, we can again sit down with our team and go, okay, we've done all this brainstorming and we've collected a little bit of data. These are the four things that we want to focus on most to get better at hitting our production targets. Okay, the next is the interrelationship diagram. So this is, again, a tool that helps you with complex problems to understand and identify the cause and effect relationships that might exist between different ideas or disparate facts associated with your problem. Now, let me show you what this might look like. So again, all these tools start with you forming a team, right? You have to have a team, this is a team sport. Get your team together, align on a problem statement, and do a little bit of brainstorming. Get a bunch of post-it notes and just put them up on the wall. Here are all of the concepts and ideas and facts surrounding this particular problem that we're trying to solve. And then the next step in this tool is to start talking about the relationships between all of these various ideas and facts and concepts. And what we do is we then draw an arrow from a cause to an effect. So you'll notice here that, for example, this sticky note causes that idea. And you can see the arrow leaves this sticky note and ends up here. Once you've drawn those arrows, you can now go through the process of identifying the most common outcomes or effects. And this happens to be the sticky notes that have the most inbound arrows. You'll notice that these two ideas or these two concepts here have a lot of inbound arrows. These are generally the primary outcomes that we're trying to solve for. And then more importantly, what you can then do is you can also identify the primary causes. So the primary drivers or the causes of the effect are the sticky notes that have the most outgoing arrows. So you'll notice these two particular ideas have a lot of outgoing arrows, meaning that they cause a lot of things to happen. So if you're doing a complex root cause analysis, this is a great tool to help you take a bunch of data and really identify those critical few things that might be causing your problem. All right, now let's talk about the prioritization matrix. So this is fundamentally a decision-making tool. 
So the way this tool works is you start with all of your options on the left hand side here. Now in this particular example, the decision I was trying to make is what do I focus my time on? So as I was creating CQ Academy, I knew I wanted to focus on the most important topic. Now to decide what, what to focus on, I wanted to go through this process of weighing the various options against specific decision-making criteria. So in this particular example, I said, okay, how many questions are on the exam from that particular topic? How difficult is that topic in general? And then what is my customer starting knowledge? And across those three different factors, I essentially rank ordered all seven categories in the body of knowledge to land on what I should be focusing on. And that came out to be statistics. You can see it here. So the highest score, the way you do this analysis is the highest score wins. So for example, when I was ranking the customer starting knowledge, I put statistics at a seven because this is the topic that people are the least familiar with when they start preparing for the CQ exam. Same thing for topic difficulty and the number of questions. Statistics has the most questions on the exam and they're often the most complex to solve. So statistics is what I really needed to focus on when creating content and helping people prepare for the exam. There's all sorts of different applications here for decision making. You know, in this particular example, we're weighing four different design options against each other. And the criteria that we selected is the quality, cost, and functionality of those various designs. Now you can see here I've applied a, a weighting factor to each criteria. Again, the baseline here is kind of 100%. And then as a team, you can kind of go up or down depending on how much you value that, that criteria or how important that criteria is to you. Another option is vendors. When you're selecting a vendor, it's really important to select them based on something other than just cost. And so that could be service, it could be quality, it could be the performance of their design or their component. There's all sorts of different criteria that might cause you to choose one vendor over another. And this is a great tool to facilitate that process of objectively picking the right supplier. Same thing with project selection. At any given moment as an engineer, I'm guessing you have 15 or 20 different projects you could be working on. And so something that can help you personally prioritize the projects that you're working on is something like a prioritization matrix. And so for example, the criteria here that you might use is what's the impact that the project's gonna have, how much is the project gonna cost, and how long is the project gonna take you? And so if you weigh these projects against each other, you'll come out to the right answer and, and identify what you really need to focus on. All right, so the very next tool, and, and now we're kind of moving into project planning, right? Now we're talking about the tree diagram here, and this is a fantastic tool to help you both you know, identify and outline all of the necessary steps to complete a complex project. And by the way, this, like every other tool, starts with a lot of brainstorming. You're gonna get your sticky notes out and you're just gonna do some brainstorming as to all of the tasks you think you're gonna need to accomplish to complete a complex project. And then the way the tree diagram works is it allows you to lay out those tasks based on the relationship that those ideas or those concepts have with each other. For example, this is a tree diagram I created for CQ Academy many, many years ago. I knew I wanted to create a CQE, at the time I called it a CQE study guide. I didn't even know I, I wanted an online course. I knew I had to create content, there was gonna be some social media, I had to build a website, and it helped me identify all of the future things I wanted to do, video, practice exams, images, you know, I've added office hours and flashcards and there's so many other features to the course now, but this was a really helpful tool back in the day to help me kind of understand all of the different tasks I needed to engage in to make CQ Academy a success. Okay, the other tree diagram or the other way to use the, the tree diagram in terms of quality is a fault tree analysis. So in the previous example with the project, I started with the goal I was trying to accomplish, right? I wanted to create CQ Academy. Here with a fall tree, we start with our top level critical event. And then what we do is we start brainstorming all of the fault conditions that might occur that might lead to that top level critical event. And the fault tree also helps you understand the relationships that exist between these faults. And it can be used to help you calculate the reliability or the likelihood of your top level critical event occurring. And the fault tree is another example of the tree diagram in action. Okay, so now it's time to talk about the process decision program chart. So I like this down here. I always like to start down here at the bottom. This tool is risk management in project management. Anytime you're implementing a complex project, there are always gonna be 
risks and challenges and obstacles and uncertainty that comes up along the way that could derail your project. And so if you're going to successfully implement a corrective action or a project over time, you have to go through the process of uncovering what those challenges are understanding what that risk is in your project, and then mitigating that risk through contingencies and countermeasures. And so the way I like to present this is, let's say we start with our tree diagram here on the left, right? This is me creating CQ Academy. Now, what you do here is you essentially go through this process of uncovering obstacles, challenges, and uncertainties. And the way you do that is by simply asking questions like, what could go wrong? What resources do I need? What assumptions have I made? what's gone wrong in the past, or just simply what if, what if, what if. And this mentality of talking about obstacles and challenges also helps you come up with the contingencies and the countermeasures that you can put in place to make sure that your project is successfully implemented on time and on budget. Okay, so the last tool is the activity network diagram. Every major complex kappa requires a lot of various activities to be implemented correctly. And so the way this tool works is it helps define the sequential tasks required to complete a project. So again, this starts with brainstorming. Outline all of the tasks that you know you're gonna to need to complete to successfully implement your project or your corrective action and just throw them up on the whiteboard using some sticky notes. And by the way, a lot of this now happens inside of softwares like Microsoft Project, but the way they work is they, they have you identify the task description, you have to talk about the duration of the task, how long is it gonna to take to complete that task, and then this is really the power of the activity network diagram, is you have to brainstorm the relationships between these tasks. What tasks have to be completed first before you can move on to the next task? And so now that we've done this, now that we've outlined these predecessors over here, we can start laying out our activity network diagram in a logical sequence. So for example, the very first task is task A, and you can see here that A is a predecessor for tasks B, C, and D. So once we complete A, we can move on to tasks B, C, and D. And then as we go on from here, you can see that task E has a predecessor of C, so we can simply put that here in the diagram. F, F is related to B, so once we finish B, we can move on to F. We've got G here, G is related to E. Task H here has a predecessor of F, so we can't start on, on H till we're done with F. We've got I, we've got J, and then finally, our last and final activity is task K. Now, once we've laid this all out, we can start talking about the critical path, right? Which of these activities is the most critical to complete the project on time? Now, this particular diagram has three different paths. You can see it down here, one, two, and then three. And so to understand the duration of these tasks, you simply just add up the time required to complete each task. So this path is path one, and if you add up the duration of tasks A, D, J, and K, you're gonna come up with 41 days. Path number two here is gonna take 51 days to complete, right, if you just add up these tasks. And then the third and final path, and this happens to be the critical path, is path number three. So this is tasks A, B, F, H, and K, and that's gonna take you 73 days. If your boss comes to you and says, how long is this going to take and what are the most important tasks, tasks A, B, F, H, and K, those are the critical ones. Those are the tasks that cannot slip and those are the ones that, that essentially define the completion date, right? It's going to take 73 days. All right. That was it for today. I really hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we covered all seven of those project management and planning tools. By the way, if you enjoyed this lecture, hit that like button so other people just like you can find the same content. If you want to go deeper into the world of, of CQE, I've got a fantastic free course for you. Head over to cqeacademy.com slash free course to get started. And again, if you really, really love this and you want to stay on that journey to become a CQE, hit that subscribe button and that bell icon so that as I publish new content, you get notified and you can stay on this journey to learn and grow. All right, thanks so much. Bye.